is a topic 7.4 strategies for user-centered design and in this topic we're going to be discussing field research uh, something called method of extremes observations interviews and focus groups questionnaires affinity diagramming participatory design prototypes and usability testing sessions so here we go let's start with field research so field research is basically when you are gathering data in the context of use so within the natural environment and this is the third point how it must be conducted in the user's environment and observations can lead to identification of um, unrecognized issues you can kind of watch and look and and understand uh, that there might be issues by you know looking for for problems that people might have in their daily lives um, artificial effects from laboratory testings can be reduced right um, and that's uh, that's important for uh, because basically you're, you're observing in the natural environment so it is natural and not as controlled as in the laboratory setting we'll, we'll get to that the whole idea of uh, artificial versus laboratory um, settings um, here's a couple of videos that I do want you to watch so go ahead and pause me and go back to the um, the slideshow and watch these two videos um, and they're gonna give you some good ideas about um, how how uh, field research is conducted Okay, here's some advantages and disadvantages of, of field, and, and this is something that the IB wants you to, to be able to um, understand. They want you to conceptually understand the, the advantages and disadvantages of each of these strategies for gathering user-centered data uh, in, in user-centered design. So here we go. Um, so field research gives you first-hand knowledge, right? Like, boom, you're, you're watching in, in a real setting what's happening. That's going to give you the experience there. You're going to obtain detailed data on people and processes. So, you know, you'll be able to, as you saw in the, the videos, you'll be able to take down um, information uh, that that's pertinent to your designs. And then it's it's going to it's going to really emphasize that role and importance of the the environment, the user's environment, where they will naturally be using the products or or where the need is naturally expressed. Um, some disadvantages that you know the data might be very narrow, right? Like you may basically um, focus on, on one thing too much and, and not see the the broader there's a saying in English um, you know you don't see the forest because of the trees um, and so basically that that can happen here too where you, you you might just focus in on on something that you really shouldn't focus in on and then it, it can be emotionally taxing as relationships between interviewers and clients uh, has to be established so you have to you know, you know, the people in the, that are being observed have to know that they're being observed. Otherwise, it's it's kind of unethical. So that 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 can be uh, taxing on people. Taxing means like hard to do or difficult. Okay, method of extremes. So this is when designing. Generally, we design for the 95th to the fifth percentile. Um, you know, an example of this is that that a doorway is designed from the 95th. Of, uh, 95th uh, percentile so that essentially all users can use it right like there are very 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 few people who are taller than the people in the 95th percentile so you don't have to worry about um, you know the the fifth percentile for this because basically everybody will be able to use the store um, and you know in another example of this is that when we when we designed for the extremes um, we we should have designed the kindergarten tables that we built. We should have we should have designed them for the fifth percentile of the user so that all the kindergarten kids could use them. And I think we kind of did that. Um, you know, we sort of looked at the uh, the fiftieth percentile um, of of um, waist height. That you know, and, and you know, it, it made it so that most kids could use it. You'd have to be really small not to be able to use the tables that we built. Um, an advantage is that you'll have a greater number of users that can be accommodated. Accommodated. Uh, the disadvantage is that maybe some that you have to be sensitive for some extreme extreme uh, groups that are involved. Okay, observation. So observation is a user trial where the intended client uses the product and uh, the expert observes. So it's basically you watching somebody use the. Um, uh, product that you've designed or the prototype that you've designed um, and you observe them and you watch what they're doing and, um, and this can be done in the field so like you know field research so um, or in in a controlled area like a lab and there's testing labs we'll talk about those in, in a few minutes okay an advantage of this is it helps unveil uh, usability issues so if you see that somebody's struggling to to uh, interact or interface with your product then you can see that firsthand um, 
another advantage is it's uh, it's tested under the conditions of use so that you're actually seeing it being used in the environment that it's meant to be used in. Um, a disadvantage is that the data collected may be difficult to analyze. So you may have collected a huge amount of data um, and you know that's going to be difficult to break it down and, and, and take lessons from. So that, that can be a problem with, with observations. All right, interviews and focus groups. And essentially these are kind of like the same thing. Uh, an interview is usually with one person. Uh, a focus group is when you are interviewing a group of people. So it's a collection of responses from users. Uh, a trial of ob observation of users interacting with the product. So it, it, it's usually, so if it's an interview, it's one person. If it's a focus group, it's, it's multiple people, okay? And this is the um, advantage of it. It's dynamic, it's face-to-face, -face, body lang language and gestures can be observed, it's, e it's easy to measure reactions, and clarifying questions can be added. So these two kind of go together. This, this dynamic and clarifying questions can be added and this is different from say a questionnaire which we'll get to next but yeah I mean I can ask follow-up questions if somebody says something I'm like wait can you explain that a little bit further that that's an advantage of this um, the disadvantage is it's 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 expensive uh, because interviewees often want to be compensated you know uh, for for doing what they're doing um, Participants may not wish to share uh, sensitive issues. Uh, small sample sizes cannot be truly representative of the whole. And then you might have a moderator bias. bias. So the moderator may have an effect on the answers that you're getting from your, your group. Um, yeah, if you just do a focus group, then you have a small sample size. And that can't really necessarily... You, you, it may be that you can't draw bigger conclusions for a larger population based on that small sample size. Okay, so those are the advantages and disadvantages of interviews and focus groups. Um, here we go. This is a, a video, and uh, please have a look at this. So this is a this is a focus group um, being interviewed. So have a, a quick look at this, and so you have a good understanding of what that looks like. Okay, a questionnaire. A questionnaire is a series of questions to solicit information. Survey also is a questionnaire, right? Um, the nice thing about them is they're cheap. They're easy to administer, and you can have large numbers of, of uh, questionnaires administered, um, and they can sent they can be sent easily to a wide location, national or global regions, right? So that's that's a good thing about them is that they're easy to administer, and you can get a lot of responses, so you can get a, a larger sample size. The disadvantage is that it's static; you really have no way of following up when somebody uh, answers a question in a certain way and you're like, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to hear more about that. But you don't have that, uh, that ability with a questionnaire. Um, you know, sometimes people don't want to answer your questionnaire and you guys have struggled with this in the past in, in uh, MYP design when, when you're doing evaluations and people are like, meh, I don't feel like doing it. Um, and maybe only interested people fill out surveys and, and perhaps that has a bias. And that, that, that's very interesting actually because quite often what happens is people who are either very pleased with a product or very displeased with a product will answer questionnaires. People in the middle are like, meh, I don't need to answer this. You know, So um, the, the people who are motivated to actually answer those questions may be the people who are, are um, at the high end who really like something you know, and at the low end. And if you, this is kind of an interesting thing when you look at uh, reviews on on products on Amazon, or if you look at reviews um, for you know um, Airbnbs or things like that, you know uh, Yelp or there's lots of different th um, apps. Uh, right, yeah, apps actually on online. You'll see that the you know you, you'll get people who rate things as like a one, and then they just go, "Wow, this is the worst thing I've ever had," and blah 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 blah. And then you get other people who are like, "Wow, this is the best. It's a ten. It's a five. Whatever the star system is." Um, you know, it was, I love this product. So, and, and then you don't have much in the middle. So you have to kind of understand that's the kind of responses that you're going to get. Okay. Uh, the next uh, strategy we have is something called affinity diagramming. And this is a graphical tool that identifies a general theme from a collection of facts, opinions, or ideas. They express data inf in information in a common format by creating clusters and groups of common information. It re represents a text-based map which shows aspects of the product that have has been and will be taken into consideration in the design and manufacturing of the product, thereby uh, presenting the results. And here, here's a video of some people doing some affinity diagramming. Basically, you're looking at a whole group of you know, facts or opinions or ideas, like, like they're saying here, and you're trying to group them into... 
um, sort of like categories. Um, and so that's if you watch this video, it gives you a good understanding of what affinity diagramming looks like. And some advan advantages and disadvantages though. Uh, so an advantage is there. It's pretty it's pretty simple to do. Like you know, you're kind of just getting together with. Usually it's 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 uh, getting together in a group of people. It's pretty cost effective, um, and it's easy to get data from a group. Um, it builds teamwork, like I said. Disadvantages: it can be quite time consuming, um, and it can it can get quite large. Um, and usually somebody is tasked with putting all the data together into these categories once they're once they're grouped. So that that can be quite time consuming. All right, participatory design is an approach to the design attempting to actively involve all stakeholders. This is employees, partners, customers, citizens, users, whoever, right, in the design process to help ensure that the results meet their needs and are usable, right. So that's participatory design. It's basically trying to get people to be part of the design process. Um, this is an example of participatory design. So it's um, it's pretty interesting, you know. This basically two people making a meal together, right? And they're participating together and and designing the meal as they go. Um, another example, and this is from the IB, is uh, when users representing the target market for a product perform realistic tasks by interacting with a paper version. This is just an example, right? This is not the the only way that participate participatory design can happen um, and so you know they, they might be um, interacting with a paper so a model or it could be actually the, the prototype um, and basically they um, so in this case they're, they're using a paper version which would be a model of a user product interface and manipulated by a person acting as a computer um, who does not explain how the inter interface works so basically what they would be doing is they'd be like oh I, I push this and a person would say okay this happens um, and and that's that's um, participatory design because they're helping the they're basically participating in the design and um, using the interface. Okay, um, there are lots of advantages and disadvantages between using natural environments and usability uh, labs. So one of the things we're going to talk about is the the advantages and disadvantages of natural environment versus usability labs. And basically, first thing we want to do is understand what a usability laboratory is, right? So if you click on this, you can you can watch a video that shows you what a usability lab is. It's basically um, an environment set up. It's an artificial environment. It's set up um, and it allows people to interact with products um, and and then you can monitor them and you can watch this video it shows you like for instance you know how they can do eyeball tracking on things um, and here's an example of that you know um, it's a the usability testing of fruit so you can see that this is a this is an application of the usability labs when you know fruit when looking at the usability of fruit it's kind of a funny video so go ahead and watch these two videos to get a good understanding of what a usability lab looks like now What's the advantage and disadvantages of having natural environments and usability laboratories? Well, in natural environments, the poten potential client is observed using the product, system, or service um, where it's intended to be used, right? And that is a huge advantage. And, and really, one of the things I would say is you kind of want to try to make sure that you are doing both of these things. Like, you, you know, it, ideally, you would do some observations in natural environments and you would do well or you would do some research in natural environments and you would do some in in a laboratory setting um, you can solicit data so the big advantage is you can solicit data from real and intended contexts usability is tested in the intended environment again that's a massive advantage but a disadvantage is that it's biased opinions from the observer so the observers can actually you know they can sort of influence the um, the setup uh, and also disadvantages is mostly qualitative data is collected, not a lot of quantitative data, so not a lot of hard numbers. It's mostly, um, you know, kind of opinions or or uh, qualitative stuff that you can't you can't crunch into the numbers. All right. Um, oh, sorry. This should say usability laboratories. I'll fix that on the um, on the actual uh, slideshow, but. Um, so in usability laboratories, again, sorry, that should say usability laboratories, um, the potential client is observed using the product system or service in a controlled environment, right? And so an advantage is controlled environments can ensure that product, service, and systems are used as intended. So you can actually make sure that, that people are using the, the product as it is intended to be used. 
groups of observers can uh, view the usability and a more wide wider view of analysis. So you can have multiple people because a lot of things that you'll notice from the these videos is that they film everything, right? And and you can also watch them as uh, streaming videos. So that's something that uh, is you know there's a lot more people that can be observers. The labs can be set up with high tech sensors and equipment for better monitoring. So like for instance the eyeball tracking and things like that. Um, and um, it can be but. So this, this is disadvantages of usability laboratories. Again, that's what I'm going to write there. Um, it can be costly as facilities personnel uh, must be hired, and it can be quite intimidating to know people are, are behind one-way mirrors because uh, often in usability laboratories, they have this sort of one-way mirrors where people can watch you, but you can't see them. Okay, thanks for watching.